Today, we're shifting gears a little bit. Uh, we'll start talking about broadcast uh, writing as opposed to print writing. Um, how we cover events in the broadcast format, how we write a, newsca a newscast for sports, and how we do highlights, all right? Sports focus today is gonna be on track and field. We're gonna cover that first. Um, I went through and I double-checked who's going to Arrowhead. Nick was the only one who was able to make it to 610 on Thursday when we went up there, and I thought we had a great visit. Uh, got to talk to them a little bit about sports radio, particularly sports talk radio. My son, Grant, he's 10 years old. He's, I predict he'll be doing something along those lines someday because he loves talking sports, knows all the stats, loves to debate, really had a good time. We got to go in uh, and to the producer's booth and talk to them a little bit about producing the show and what they go through. And then went on the other side of the window where the hosts were and they got to talk to us some and then they got into a very heated discussion about Big 12 uh, whether Oklahoma will leave the Big 12 or not, should they start their own network, um, should they allow Oklahoma's quarterback another year of eligibility within the conference, and really got heated, and we walked out of there, and my son was just like, he thought that was really cool. So, um, one of the things I took away from it was where they were saying, you know, we hear a lot that radio's dying, they said radio listenership is up more than it's ever been. That it's absolutely not true that radio is dying because like with print, like with television, there are so many more ways to get the message out there through social media, through the use of videos, through things like that. One of the big things that John Hansen was the, the station manager that we talked to, one of the big things he said was students coming out have got to recognize you're not going to be big time right away. You have to be persistent. You have to be patient. You have to stay the course and keep doing the things you're supposed to do. If you do all that and you have some talent, you will get there. But the thing that separates those who get there and those who don't is the same path. You gotta come on and work part time. In a radio, most of your jobs, and if you're gonna be talented, if you're gonna be on air, are gonna be part time to start out. And they are not gonna pay well. But if you stay the course, if you keep working at it, if you keep showing up, if you keep showing what skills you have, if you make yourself indispensable by being a good writer, by being in tune with social media, by being thoughtful about the topics you're gonna cover, by having maybe some video skills, by being willing to go out and do that remote on the weekend that nobody else wants to do. Hi, Jane. Hey. If you're willing to do those things that other people don't wanna do, you're gonna get your chance. You're gonna make it. Okay. I would say the same thing for if you want to go into television, if you want to go into print, whatever it is you want to go. If you want to get out of sports and do anything else, staying power is the thing you have to keep in mind. All right? Nick, what else did, what did you take away? Uh, I just was time consuming, like <clears throat> what Ryan was saying. It took a lot of work and time to get up to where he was. I know he's been in the six, ten, four years. He finally took over as producer a year ago. Yeah. They should. Yeah. Being patient, doing the little things, staying in there. So. And then what he did in college, too. Yeah. He talked about he was at UMKC. Yeah, he, and he, and he started all their sports. Did he say they had an online station? Or they yeah, had, they had online. Okay. Uh, I know, I always joke that they're going to rename their press box, Ryan Brzezowski. <laughs> press box, because he's always there. Because he was calling games a couple years after he graduated. Yeah, when he was there, they had an online radio station and they weren't doing anything with sports. And he and a buddy said, let's start calling games on our, on our online station. So they did. And then there in the Mountain West, the Mountain West made a rule much like we have in the MIAA that all games have to be webcast. However you do it at your school, that's how you do it. But they all have to be webcast. So UMKC got a system um, very similar to what we have. I believe it was my successor as sports information director here. He went to UMKC as the SID. I believe it was during his tenure because he contacted me about what we used to do our webcast. They got with Ryan and his buddy and said, hey, would you guys, since you're already doing a webcast audio-wise, can we just use your audio with our video webcast? They said, sure. So they did it. He got some great experience. 610 came calling. After he left, the students that took over were like, eh, we'll do this game now. I don't feel like doing that game now. But well, maybe. And then the athletic department said, look, if you're not going to do this, we're going to have to hire it out. We'll go get somebody else if you're not going to take advantage of this opportunity. And so 
he was just a guest. He's like, what the heck are you guys doing? Why would you not take advantage of this opportunity? If, guys, if you want to work in this industry, you have to do it now. You have to get that experience. I told him what we do with our high school show, Midwest Missouri Gridiron Report, where we do highlights of the area high school shows and how we go out and we do play-by-play -play and color for a game of the week. He said, man, that's great. He said, that's exactly what they should be doing. If they want to get into this business, that's the kind of experience they need to have. So the opportunities are there through our classes, through the intro to sports broadcasting and the advanced sports broadcasting, through that special project, through sports page, the practical and sports page. The opportunities are there. We're getting our online radio station going, and we have a daily or a weekly um, sports talk show called Campus Chatter that you can be a part of. The opportunities are there. You have to take advantage of it simply. Okay? All right. You gonna be able to go to the Arrowhead tomorrow? Yes. Okay, are you meeting us up there? Are you coming? Yeah, I was meeting up there. Cool. All right, that's saves us a seat. Okay. Uh, we're gonna start out today talking about track and field. We have with us Jada Hill. Woo woo! Jada has been working with us online because she's in St. Louis. She runs track for the Jennies. Michael runs track track for the mules and cross country. You had your hand up, you have a question. Oh, I was wondering, I mean, I was gonna let you know that I was just gonna meet you guys up there. You're gonna meet us there too? Mm -hmm. Okay. So they can give us some insights as we talk about track and field. Track and field, not real big in the United States, not like it is overseas. Why do you think that is? You guys run, why you probably heard Kip Chamber. We we are blessed here at UCM to have a track coach who competed in the Olympics. Didn't win. He did win the 1500 in the, in the decathlon in the Olympics. Um, he didn't win the he didn't win an Olympic medal, but the fact that he was one of the Olympic athletes, that's pretty big time. Owns all kinds of age group records and stuff in decathlon in the country. Um, but in, in the United States, track and field just not that big. Why is that? Um, I think just mainly because just we do have like a couple of international people on the team, and just like growing up, I've ran with a lot of international people. And just like over there, like, you know, like organized like team sports just aren't like that big of a thing. And they're like, okay, well, we're just going to. Oh, like, soccer. Yeah, exactly. So there's soccer, like rugby and track. And it's like, okay, well, if you're not too good at the other two, but you're fast, then you should just do track. And so like, um, I don't know, over here, it's more like, you know, like football, basketball ordeal. And then people just do track, like, just to like stay in shape for like their other season. But over there, like there's not many other seasons. So it's just like track all the time, 24-7. Okay. Michael, what do you think? I, I think the market's big with other sports in the U.S. So. Track meets take a long time. We've webcast a couple of our track meets, and a small track meet takes 8 to 10 hours of a webcast all day long. A football game takes three. You know? And in track, one of the things you have to think about in track, there's a lot of dead time because when you're doing prelims, like say for instance for the 200, when you're doing prelims, you may have eight preliminary races of a 200 to decide who's going to the finals. And it's weird because you look and see, you have eight lanes, but we only run in four. Well, why is that? Well, it's because the first two lanes, I think it is, are really tight. So they don't make a run on those. That outside lane, you're up against the wall. They don't really want somebody to run on that one. So they kind of, they don't use the full track. But because athletes compete in different races and you have to have recovery time, we're not starting the two. We may get through the 100, there may be some scratches. We may get through the 100 45 minutes early. We're not starting the 200 until the 200 is supposed to start because those athletes have to have time to recover. So then there's a lot of dead time. There's two ways of running track. There's indoor and there's outdoor. Indoor, if you look at the multi, this is how the arena is set up. And this, as a somebody covering track and field, this is something you need to think about. This is not the scale, it's not the prettiest drawing. But think about it. this is the basketball floor. Track surrounds it, okay? The court may end, the court's kind of in here. They're gonna have bleachers here. High jump goes on in the apron over here. You have high, long jump and triple jump for the women, I believe it is, on this side. Long jump and triple jump for the men on this side. Down here at the other end, you have the pole vault, you have the shot put, and you have the weight throw. 
I noticed that the track is all around this, so the field events happen, and then you get to the track events, okay? All condensed within the multi. Indoor track and field's kind of cool because there is stuff going on the whole time. But you as a reporter need to think about, okay, where is everything? Because I may be, for my coverage area, be looking at a pole vaulter who is fantastic, looking at a state record, looking at a national record, looking to qualify, what have you. I need to cover that pole vault. But I also have a men's triple jumper. Okay, so when are they doing the pole vault? When are they doing the triple jump? Because I'm on opposite ends of the arena, and I want to make sure I get photos of each of them, I get video of each of them, um, I'm able to cover what they're doing, and I got a race from either side of the multi. Track events get started, that's not as big a deal because everything's happening right here. But those field events, that can be tough, okay? That's indoor. Outdoor, and this is done differently in different places, much to the chagrin of our track and field coaches, is really spread out. Used to be everything for track happened at the stadium. What happened at our stadium that made them change where they did field events? put in field turf. They are not going to throw the javelin in Crane St or in the Walton Kennedy Stadium because you are not throwing a javelin in the field turf. So it got moved. They had to adapt the track because of the stadium renovations. No more long jump, triple jump pits. They got moved. Okay. They still high jump in here in the apron. I've been to an outdoor track and meet here in some time. Yeah, they, they still do the high. Okay, so the only field event that happens in the stadium is the high jump. The rest of them, think about this is the multi. These are the practice fields, the baseball fields way up here. They do the hammer and discus right here. They do the shot put here. And then they do the javelin over here. Then across the street, I think this is right, they've got the pole vault here and the long jump over here. Or, or flip that around. But again, if you're covering, I may be wanting, and they will do field events and track events at the same time because they can, they're more spread out, which works great for the meet because the meet keeps going. But I may be trying to cover somebody doing the javelin and the high jump, all right? Better have a quick horse or something to get me back and forth. So when you get in, you need to think about where is everything happening? Who am I covering? What is the time frame of when I'm gonna be covering these things? And how am I gonna go about getting all that, okay? Um, talking to Kip, one of the things that he has said that helps overseas with the interest in uh, track and field is they'll do what's called showcase meets and they'll only do certain events. They won't do a full track meet. They'll maybe only do a field meet, which goes much more quickly. It's shorter. It's just a field event. And then another day they'll do track. So they'll just do the track events on that day. Sometimes they'll have all the prelims on one day, and you know, okay, I don't let you go see the prelims because my student athlete or my professional doesn't qualify for finals. I really don't care. I can write about the fact they didn't qualify, and I just go on qualifying day where they have all the finals. The MIAA track and field uh, track and field meet goes over three days, yes. but the first days heptathlon, decathlon, and field events, correct? There's some field events. Uh, the first day is like usually all multi, and then the second day is prelims, and then the last is finals. Okay, yeah. We have did it a couple times. You get the finals on the last day. Well, it's quicker. Now, you do have that sitting time because of recovery time, but you get to the main events. You get to the finals, and that's really what you're interested in. All right? So you just need to know a little bit about the event, the meet in itself, the way they're going to run it, and how you're going to go cover it. Okay. First of all, you need to prepare and learn the basics of track and field. Before you go, know what events they're going to be com uh, competing in. Know what the events are. There is a difference between a weight throw and a hammer throw. Do men know the difference? Besides you two? Weight throw, the weight is heavier and it's on a shorter handle. It's like the, the ball's right here and then you got the handle right here. Same technique, you're spinning trying to get momentum and then you toss it. But it's heavier because you don't want to throw it as far because why? It's indoors. They do the weight throw indoors. Hammer throw they do outdoor. Hammer The hammer ball is about this big. It gets 16 pounds, if I'm right. 
I'd have to go back and look at that again. And it's on a long chain, and it's meant to throw farther, but same technique. You're spinning it, trying to see how far you can throw it, okay? They don't do the javelin indoor because you don't have enough room and you're gonna impale somebody. Um, indoor races for the sprints, you do the 60 meter hurdles and the 60 meter dash. Outdoor, it becomes the 100 meter uh, hurdles for women, 110 meter hurdles for men, 100 meter dash. Heights of hurdles change men and women. Heights of hurdles change if it's the, the 100 or 110 versus the 400, okay? So you need to know what the events are. Uh, you need to know how they're doing their prelims. Are they gonna, do you get three attempts to move on to the next round? and then to the finals, or is it just three attempts and you're into the finals? So you need to know the scoring for that. You need to know how they're gonna score the meet because not all meets are scored. Some are open events, so just a mishmash of individuals can compete. Other times, like the MIAA championships, you're going to have teams competing for a championship. You may have a meet that has teams competing, but it's not a scoring meet. So you need to find out, is this a scoring meet or not? Okay, why would that be important? Exactly. If they don't score the meet, there's no winner. Okay, so you need to know whether they're going to be scoring it or not. Um, NCAA provisional and automatic standards. Learn what those are for each event. The automatic standard is if you hit this mark, you're going to the national championships. Plain and simple. You may stink up the joint the rest of the, of the year. A lot of times athletes will try and compete in their first meet. 3,000 meter steeplechase, for example. Grueling event. 3,000 meters and you have to jump over four hurdles around the track as you're running. And one of the hurdles you have to jump, you have to jump on the hurdle into a water pit, okay? It's grueling. A lot of times athletes will maybe compete in two during a regular season. They may go to six or eight events, six or eight meets, but they only compete in the steeplechase twice because it takes so much out of you. You try and get qualified at the first meet you can, and then you may not run it again until the national championships, okay? But you hit an automatic mark, you're going to national championships. Provisional mark is if they don't fill the field with automatics, they'll start going to the provisionals and they'll start working down the line of those who qualify provisionally. And say so they want 15 in the field, they got eight automatic qualifiers, the next seven fastest times that meet the provisional time will advance. Now what happens if they don't get seven provisional times that, are, that qualify? or they don't get seven provisional qualifiers. Well, if they only have five provisional qualifiers, they fail 13 instead of 15, okay? But learn what those standards are, and they change every year because they'll look and see how many did they get, and if they only had five, then they'll lower the standard a little bit, okay? Like I said, go to the event early so you can find out, get the packet where it says the schedule where it says when they're gonna do prelims, when they're gonna do finals, um, what events your athletes are in and where they're gonna be competing in that venue. If you've never been there before, this is especially important. Even if you have been there, they may change things. They may move things around, okay? So make sure you know that. Um, find out who's in the event. Get some biographical information on each of the athletes competing, particularly those that are in your coverage area, because those are the ones you're gonna be writing about, but also, Think about people they're going to be competing against. I may be going to a meet. Jada may have the fastest time in the 100. I want to know who the next two or three are. That's her top competition. Who's going to be pushing her? Okay. Obviously, you're going to focus on local athletes. You want to describe battles in races. A lot of times when you have field event races, you'll get a pack that's running together, and then somebody will break away later on but that pack is still there fighting for second, and you want to focus on that battle. Is it, are they keeping in there really tight? Are they just shifting a lot? Does there seem to be any, are punches ever thrown, elbows ever thrown in, in long distance running? Yeah. Yeah. Huh? Elbows. Elbows, you get some cleats in the back of your leg. I shifted her a long time. It was totally an accident though, on the four by four. She tried to like, For Shada. she tried to pass me, like we, were like, we were like coming off the curb and I was like last and it was like to qualify like whenever I did like junior Olympics, like when I was younger, 
and like it was like the qualifying meet, and the the t whoever one made it, and we were coming off the curb, and she tried to pass me, and she tripped over like my ankle, and then they like tried to after the meet, they were like, did you do that on purpose? And I was like, no, I swear I didn't even hear. They really did hear, but she she tried to pass me the curb. There, there are rules in track and field. I mean, you are, there are rules, there are unspoken rules. Okay. But when you go to pass somebody, so Chris and I are running neck and neck, and you know Chris is going to be beating me because I'm slow. But say I suddenly get a burst, and I try and pass him, and I just try and step right in front of him, I can get called for a foul because I, if I interfere with him and I don't give room, then I can be called for a foul and disqualified. I've got to get up far enough to cut in front of him that I don't impede his progress. You get caught throwing an elbow in a race. Yeah, Marquis threw elbows all the time. Shocking. <laughs> you, ever, you know Marquise Jones? Little sharp elbows? Yeah, I can see that. Okay. So you have to watch those things. Uh, you need to think about, like, for instance, in the hurdles. You have to go down your lane at your hurdles. Now, do you have to jump the hurdles? Very few people know this. You could run under the hurdles if you wanted to. No penalty. Slow you down. I ran the hurdles when I was in high school. Hit everyone. I was always the first one to the first hurdle and usually to the second hurdle, and then that was all she wrote. Because these little stubby legs did not get over hurdles very well. And I was not fast, like I said, but I was quick. I was quick out of the block. My dad, after a race, says to me, do you get penalized for hitting all those hurdles? I said, yeah, number one, it slows you down. Number two, it really hurts. And they're wood, <laughs> you know, they don't give a whole lot, it hurts. But you can go under the hurdles. It's just, you're not gonna go very fast. If you clip your neighbor's hurdle, you're disqualified. If you run out of your lane over somebody else's hurdle, you're disqualified. If you step on the lane line, you're disqualified. So you may blow everybody away. I may be three hurdles in front and get kind of crossway and step on the lane line, I'm disqualified. I didn't impede anybody, but I stepped on the lane line. Okay, so you've got to learn what those rules are too. Same as we talked about with uh, cross country, look at splits, particularly in the distance races. Uh, look at pack running during a race to see if there are some elbows being thrown. When I was at uh, Missouri Southern, we competed a lot against Central Missouri. Central Missouri had several Russian runners. Missouri Southern had lots from Finland. Finns and Russians don't like each other, apparently. Did not know this. There were a lot of elbows thrown. We had a, a conference, conference cross-country meet run at Missouri Southern while I was down there. And one of the Russians from Central, as he passed a guy, one of our Finnish runners, turned around and punched him in the face. He got disqualified. Missouri Southern ended up winning the, the conference championships because this Russian got disqualified. Well, Central won, but because of that, they lost. So you're going to see there may be some nasty, heated battles. A lot of trash talking happens, especially when you get to International Olympics or International Track and Field and like the Olympics and stuff. There's a lot of trash talking that goes on. Makes it more, more entertaining. After the race, uh, you need to start doing some interviewing. So use some advanced research to focus your reporting. Talk about if an athlete's coming back from an injury. Um, talk about if there are some of those rivalries, those types of things. Ask the athletes uh, what they learned from their previous competitions. Did running at this uh, this field or this uh, this track help you? You wouldn't think it'd make that much of a difference. A track's a track, right? No. Different track compositions, different venues. You know, you think about your outdoor running wind. If it's a more open stadium, that wind may play a factor versus if you're in a more enclosed stadium. So, what their experience taught them. Talk with coaches early. Why do you think that's important? Get in there and talk to those coaches early. Why do you think you should do that? Because they're not going to talk to you. Are they going to be busy during the meet? I'm often surprised at how much more uh, loquacious track and field coaches are than other coaches during a meet. I can just walk up and talk to a lot of the coaches that I've known briefly. But if I were trying to interview them or really get into a long discussion, they're not going to appreciate that. So try and get to them early before the meet ever gets started and just visit with them a little bit about strategy, about what the plans are for the day, that sort of thing, and then just let them go, right? okay? They are trying to coach too. It's not like a football game or a basketball game where there's, they're on a clock, everything's moving at a certain pace, but they are still trying to coach. So visit with them early, get them after the meet, but then once the meet gets going, 
let them do their thing. Okay. Don't forget to field athletes. That happens a lot because again, they're spread out so many different places. We focus on the track. A lot of field athletes have changed the name from track and field to field and track because they get forgotten. So make sure you get to them too. Besides, track's boring. You just run it. I always tell Jay to run fast, turn left. Uh, when you're riding, some of the things to keep in mind, this was on your, one of your assessments for, I believe it was cross country. First reference would be 12 minutes, 37.2 seconds. Now this is print, all right? Then you give the time examples, okay? Same thing with distances. Um, compare the performances by offering gaps in time or geography, okay? So if you're talking about the times, the big time differences, Talk about somebody won by over 30 seconds. Think about those types of things. Same thing with the heights and lengths, whether it's a high jump or a, a long jump. Um, consider the top individual performances. Make sure you introduce the name of the meet and where it was held early in the story. You don't want to forget that. And then just offer, at the end, offer a quick summary of some of the key results, okay? Just kind of talk about UCM one Five events, list those. They were in the top three and 10 others, something like that, okay? All right. Our big focus today is going to be on broadcast news writing. <laughs> Why is no my piece the cover? Because that's the only good picture I have. That was one of our first shows. Broadcast news writing differs from print. How? One spoken, one read. One spoken out loud, one's read, okay? Which is pretty accurate to the big issue. So what do you have to think about if one is spoken versus read? You as the reporter, you as the writer, what do you need to think about in the fact that one of them is going to be spoken, the other one will be read? You have to think about the person reading it and how they're going to sound. You also need to think about the audience who's hearing it. Because if I have a newspaper or a magazine and I'm reading a story and something didn't make sense, I can go, wait a minute, what? And go back and reread it. If I'm listening to a sportscast and something is unclear, Now I understand this is 2016, it's going to end up on YouTube or end up on the website and I can go back and listen to it later anyway, but it may be the next day, it may be in an hour before I can go back and listen. You need to write in such a way that this person doesn't look like a fool while he or she is reading it off the teleprompter and we're next week going to go downstairs to our studio and I'm going to throw some stuff up on a teleprompter and have you sit at the desk and try and read it as the teleprompter is moving. Ask Jada, ask Michael, ask Matthew. How easy that is to do? That's really easy. Don't make it seem like it's hard. Well, it's really easy after you've done it for a while. Yeah. Yeah. To my point here, Jada. Oh, sorry. It's hard. <laughs> it's harder than reading it off a magazine because it is a scrolling, and especially if you get somebody running a teleprompter who is kind of sketchy in running the teleprompter. Okay. But you need to think about that. You need to think about. You know, you're going to have a certain block of space in which to get the, the, get the text. You need to think about some people's eyesight's not the greatest. Okay? So those, those are a lot of things you have to think about. And then you have to think about the person on the other side of the screen who's listening to this. And it, are they going to be able to follow along? So what we're going to talk about today, part is for the news reader. Part of it is going to be for the audience. Okay? Six things to remember is, number one, it's okay to dramatize. This is sports. It's supposed to be fun. This is one of the things we have a hard time getting students comfortable with, is dramatizing, using vocal inflection, using words that are more dramatic, trying to get people excited about it. It's sports. Have fun with it. Um, video is essential. So if you can get video to go with your story, get it. There are going to be times, there are going to be stories that you do that are just a reader. 
Readers are when you see the anchor at the desk, maybe with an over-the-shoulder graphic, and they're just given a very brief story, just a very brief announcement. But otherwise, you want to get some video to go with it, okay? Think about using contractions. It's okay in broadcast to use contractions, but make sure it's very clear. Make sure those contractions come at a time where uh, they're not going to get lost in the wording. So there's not, there doesn't need to be emphasis. So for example, if I want to say the president isn't going versus the president is not going, I want to emphasize. It's something we would think the president is going to be going to. He is not going. We need to stress that. So don't use the contraction in that case. Keep it personal. Your audience is inviting you into their home. This is one of the things we were talking with them at 610. Whenever you're doing your story, they want to feel like you're a person. They want to, your audience wants to feel like you're one of them. So keep your writing personal. Keep it more communicative. It's okay in broadcast writing to say you, to speak in second person. In print, we don't do that. But in broadcast, I'm speaking right to you, Alan. So I want to use that. Okay? We're building a level of trust. I think we've talked about this quite a bit, use active verbs. So instead of saying something like, the fast moving linebacker was suddenly in the backfield, which is very long, the linebacker burst into the backfield. Shorter sentence, a lot of punch, very active, we're moving forward, okay? Mind your verb tense. In broadcast, keep in mind that we're, I'm talking to you right now, so I wanna tell you what's happening right now. A football coach may, or a football player may have been signed to a fat contract, well he was signed. You might say, um, Aqib Talib is recovering nicely after being shot in the leg. He was shot in the past. How's he doing now? Give the update. Does that make sense? So as much as you can, get into present tense. As much as possible, avoid interjections where you're interjecting new text. The Jennies, who are second in the MIAA, are now 17 and two overall, 10 and two in conference play. This interjection right here, who are second in the MIAA, you think about that as you hear it. The Jennies, who are second in the MIAA, are now, so I've got all kinds of information coming at you and I've thrown this into the middle of it. And I'm making my audience have to think about a couple of different things at one time. So let's break that in a couple sentences. The Jennies are currently second in the MIAA. They are 17 and two overall and 10 and two in conference play. Does that make more sense? Easier to listen to? much easier to read, okay? So think about that. Some important style rules. Um, again, in broadcast, up through 11 we spell out, always. Always, always, always. Doesn't matter what the context is, we spell them out. 12 to 999 we use numerals, okay? 1000 and up we use combinations of numerals and words. That should be spelled out 3000. 100 million, um, that should be spelled out second million, 12 billion, okay? So we use combinations there. The only exception is when. When do you think you wouldn't use the combinations? Years. <clears throat> this is 2016, not 2016. You go ahead and write out 2016, okay? It's right here. We spell out all symbols. We don't use any symbols in broadcast. We spell them all out. Um, spell out fractions and decimal points. So three fourths, uh, 0.8 percent, 7.5 million, things like that. We do use numbers when they're in similar case. So like for a score, it'd be 24 to 10, not 24 to, and then spell out 10. So if numbers are going to be used in a similar context. Go ahead and use numbers. Okay. Abbreviations, we'll go ahead and write them the way they're said. We always say MIAA. We don't say MIAA. We say MIAA. So write it that way. We say NBA, NCAA. We use the hyphens in there to make it clear to the reader on the desk NCAA. We're saying three letters. That hurt, didn't it? 
we don't we spay the double A so that people don't look at it, and we use the hyphen so it's not like Mia. That makes sense. Okay, so use those hyphens. If it's an unfamiliar organization, say the name of it first. What's now? That's an abbreviation. What is now? Right. It's unclear. So what is it? National Organization of Women. So you would write National Organization of Women on first reference. Don't split your sentences on different pages. Now I know we're talking about that you're going to be reading off a teleprompter, but guess what? Sometimes teleprompters go down and you have to go to your script. If you split the sentence between the two pages, I'm going to start reading the sentence and have to turn my page. So make sure you stop the sentence on one page before you start the next one, okay? There's different schools of thought on emphasis because some places everything is spelled out in all caps and the entire script is in all caps. I don't prefer that. I prefer upper and lower case so that if I have a word or a phrase I want to emphasize, I can do it in all caps. Some teleprompters won't let you underline. If you do do things in all caps, underline, for instance. You can't bold on a teleprompter. Okay. Spell it right. Why is that important? Let's face it, talent's divas. I'm not. Marcus is. Yeah. Okay, Katie, bad. keep telling yourself that. You're, no, you're not that bad. You're not as bad I'm as we've had. Bad. Talent can be very divish. They have a right to be. They've earned it. They've worked their way to that point. Okay? To be on the desk, you typically have to put in a lot of time, a lot of effort to get on the desk. You have a huge responsibility. I'm not the one that the audience is trying to focus on or trying to invite to my home or trusting in. I'm trusting in the person I'm seeing on television, okay? Your number one job as a broadcast news writer is to make the talent look good. And if you spell something wrong so that they mispronounce it or it's confusing, they look bad. Then they're gonna be mad at you, okay? Spell it correctly. It is gonna help your credibility with around the station because I keep getting scripts with misspellings, I don't look very educated, and I'm not going to advance. Um, for pauses, we either use ellipses, which is the three dots. How I many of you knew that term? Good for you. Or we use hyphens. We use the, the ellipses instead of commas because we tend to read right over commas. Now, you'll go ahead and use commas in dates and in city and state. So it would be Warrensburg, comma, Missouri, not Warrensburg, ellipses, Missouri. Okay. But any other time, if you've got a list, if you were trying to make a pause, you use the ellipses. I can use more, three would be for a comma, where it, be, it would be in place of a comma. I can use multiple if I want my reader to take a long pause. I tend to use hyphens in that case, because I want them to make more of a pause, I want to build more effect, things like that. The Kansas City Royals lost. Again, I'm gonna have three or four hyphens there to draw that out, okay? Um, pronunciations, you need to think about how you pronounce a word and you need to write that in. Now you go ahead and write the name in there. Um, so for example, print, we're held to 
space constraints and broadcast or time. We have so much time for our story, you need to think about how much time do I have? What other stories are around it? How much emphasis are we gonna put on this story? This is where framing theory comes in. Those of you who've had theories of communication. All right, how are we gonna frame this story? Is this gonna have a lot more detail? Is it gonna have graphics? Is it gonna have video to go with it? We need to think about those types of things. So we don't want dead air. So we need to keep this thing moving along. We don't wanna go into the next story or the next newscast or the next whatever is going to be coming on, so we have to keep that in mind. So you have to time everything. I have 30 minutes assigned for this newscast, or I have three minutes for my sportscast. So I need to know how much time do I have for each story, including my tosses, including my teases, including any banter. So I need to figure out how long do I have, so you have to time it all. And then test it. Read it out loud. How many of you, you've all had public speaking at this point, I'm assuming? Do you practice your speeches quietly, Allison? No. Do you read them out loud? Yeah. Why? Because you can like find the same people like words sound weird or boring. Yeah. I was talking to, I think it was Nick, we were talking about editing the other day, and I said, even in a print story, read it out loud. Because when you're reading it in your head, it makes sense. You're the one who wrote it, there's a good chance you're gonna skip right over the words. But if you read it out loud, you'll catch them more easily. You'll also be able to tell if you've got a lot of S sounds together, so you get this, a lot of sibilance, or a lot of rub R sounds together, where you get a lot of rumble, so you can catch those types of things. Okay. And then you need to be efficient. That's a good one. So avoid extraneous words, wordiness. Don't say in three words what you could say in one. That happens a lot when we start using a lot of adjectives and adverbs. Use active verbs, so you're gonna avoid that. It's gonna make your story a little bit shorter. Avoid stretching out the story by just trying to banter on and keep talking about the same thing over and over and over again. Um, and then look for, again, look for the unnecessary words. Look at your length, look at the form you're using, look at supporting your lead, look at your information selection, and make sure you're making sense. Those are things you need to keep in mind. Story length, which stories are gonna deserve more time? If you're putting your sportscast together, which stories are going to deserve more time? Which are the most relevant? Which are the most timely? Which are the most important? Most readers are going to be about 20 to 25 seconds. Most packages will be about a minute and a half. But again, a package is going to be given a little more emphasis. Okay, But you don't want to do all of your readers and then all of your packages. You want to intersperse. Okay. In doing so, you need to think about the length of the entire newscast because this story has to fit within the whole thing, all right? So you need to think about how long can I have this story because what other stories are going to be in there to fill out that entire cast. Oh, one other point I want to make here at the end of this. Today we use social media and push audiences to other sources like our website, social media blogs. That was one of the things we learned about at 610 the other day, is they, they live off of social media. I asked them about writing, and they said, well, honestly, we don't do a whole lot of writing. Because social media, Twitter, has taken over more of their writing. He said, I'd love to have a couple guys maybe do a blog, but if they don't stay consistent with it, it becomes stagnant. He said, so we just don't do it anymore. But they live on social media, and what you do is you talk on social media and try and drive them to your newscast drive them to your website. But this is where you hear a lot of stories. To get more on this story, go to our website, knbc.com. Okay? So I can give you a 30 minute or a 30 second reader, but then push you to my website for more details. Remember, you're not writing an inverted pyramid. You're trying to build to a, con a climax. So make sure when you are writing that story out, you're building to something. And then remember, you've got to support your lead. Don't make promises in that lead that you're not going to fulfill. Don't talk about we're going to a certain player who had a great game, and then you don't get any detail about that player's game. Okay? Lead them into the story, get them excited, and then make sure you get the detail to it. You don't have time to say it all, and this is where your website really will come in. Hit them with the most important stuff, the who, what, when, where, okay, get them with those things, give them some of the key points of what was going on, 
And then if you have to drive to the website, drive to the website. Why do you want to tell a story? Why is it important? Why is a baseball game in March important to talk about? It may not be. It may not be the most important story. The most important story may be the 5K that's happening this weekend that is a major fundraiser for childhood cancer. That may be the big story because you may be getting a huge audience out there for that. You may be getting a lot of, re of viewers who are interested in that story. That may be the more important story. So think about which story is more important. That's gonna help you decide what form to take, whether it's a reader, whether it's gonna be a package, gonna tell you where to place it, those types of things. Okay. Use the pertinent of facts, the things that are most important. You need to explain the details. You need to explain if there's any unusual language. And then remember to keep it one idea at a time. Again, this is where, where we're talking about interjections, where you're interjecting new information in the midst of a sentence. Keep your sentences to one idea at a time. They may be short. Your vocal inflection is where you get the interest. A lot of times, early writers, every sentence is really short. That's where vocal inflection will build the interest in it break up the monotony of shorter sentences, okay? Again, always do your research and also never assume that your audience has been following along with this story. Muhammad Ali died this weekend, okay? People may not be aware that he died, so somewhere there you need to say when it was he died and how old he was. Remind them that he suffered from Parkinson's. Remind them that he had been sick, gone into the hospital, and then passed, okay? So keep those things in mind. All right? How many of you have done much broadcast writing versus print? What's easier? Um, I personally like broadcast. Okay. Because I like to read, be able to like, it's more conversation and stuff. It's easier. There's, there's been a lot of talk in like newspaper and magazine writing that maybe we should take more of that conversational tone because people don't like to read ma magazines or newspapers as much as they once did because, well, it's just only the person. Yeah, I like that. I do more broadcasting than I school than I do newspaper. Okay. What about you two? What do you like better? Broadcast. Broadcasting? I'm in the same boat as her. I learned that before high school. Okay. One. That, I'm going to hold that off until we talk about highlights. Okay. Um, your assignment for. Let's do uh, next Sunday, not this coming Sunday. You don't have any stories due this coming Sunday. Yes, you do your feature story that was assigned last week. For next Sunday, June 19th, is a sports cast. Hmm? That's my birthday. When's your birthday? June 19th. Oh, well, happy birthday. Today's my anniversary. Oh, happy anniversary. Thank you. My wife's been picking up after me for 18 years. Uh, your next your assignment for the 19th is to write a sports cast. Okay, all the details are here for what I want you to do. You're writing a three to five minute sports cast. Um, I want three readers, and imagine you have two packages. You don't write the package. Okay, you will not put a, those, the script for a package in a newscast script, so you don't have to write it. But I want you to think about what packages would I include, okay, and where you're going to place them in the sports cast. Um, your audience is the Warrensburg market, so pick your stories accordingly. Um, that could include Kansas City sports. It could include things happening, like we have a swim team here in town. We have a Legion baseball team here in town. A couple of places that people, the sports writers or broadcast, get their stories, local newspapers, local magazines, um, flyers from Parks and Rec, information from web, the website, from the uh, the local college or local professional team. That's where they get a lot of their story ideas. Okay. This is the long assignment script. I'll go back and look at that. This is how it will look. What you have here, if you go to the columns, or I'm sorry, the uh, make a table. 
come up to where is it? So if you go to new, uh, one row, two columns, just insert that. And then you're going to put your, the left hand side of a new uh, television script is the video, what we're going to be seeing there, what camera we're going to be taking, um, what graphics we're going to be pulling up, what we're going to be putting a, a package in, that sort of thing. The right hand side is the audio, and this is what the anchors are going to be reading. Okay. You want them to line up. So, for example, when they start saying, when the anchor starts saying, the UCM Jennings soccer team fell two to one to, in overtime to Fort Hayes State, those I want an over the shoulder graphic to come in there. Okay, OTS stands for over the shoulder. Uh, take full page graphic of soccer versus Fort Hayes State. I want that to happen right here. This is for my director, so my director knows when to be calling for these particular elements in the script. Okay, so they make need to line up perfectly. Okay. Cut to CU. CU stands for close up on camera one of Haley. So we're going to go from this full page graphic to this. Make sense? I'm not concerned with if you spell out, take full page graphic, take lower third, take what have you. I'm not really concerned about that. I want to see that you've got it lined up, and I want to see that your sports cast is blocked in such a way that you don't have all your readers listed and then all your packages, that you mix it up a little bit, that you have some interesting uh, variation. And I want to see your writing, see that you write uh, using this, the things we just talked about, using the broadcast elements, broadcast style, um, that you've chosen some interesting stories to go with it, that sort of thing. Okay? Make sense? All right, I'm going to go back and look at that assignment sheet to make sure it's up to date. Okay, what we have left to talk about is cutting the highlights. And quite honestly, this is pretty quick, so we're going to go ahead and go through it. And I'm going to take a break. We're just going to plow on through. Okay. Highlights, cutting highlights for sports to do like a highlight package. Or when we talk about highlights, what we're doing is cutting the video, we're writing the script, and we're actually reading that from the desk. So what happens is the anchor, say for instance, Chris is going to be anchoring for us. He's going to maybe go out and he'll maybe shoot the highlights himself. Maybe he'll go out with Matthew and Matthew will shoot them and Chris will be the reporter and he'll just be taking notes and he'll maybe do a stand up, which is what this is. Okay. But what happens is you write the script and then you take, cut the video to go with that script, and then you sit at the desk, and while the video is playing, you're talking about the highlights. This is what you see on SportsCenter when they talk about the highlights from last night. They're sitting at the desk, reading the script, but they're matching up the highlights, okay? What's the difference between this and a pre-recorded package? In a pre-recorded package, it's saying that you would like drop it in and post. Is that what you mean? In a pre-recorded package, you're putting those videos together and you're recording the audio, okay? So I lay down my audio track under the video and if I read too fast or too slow or what I had scripted doesn't take as long as the video, I can cut some of that video. Or I'm like, oh, I gotta say a little bit more and I'll get a little more detail to it, okay? In the studio, if I get excited, because usually we speak one certain pace when we're talking to our friends, when we're talking like this, we have a tendency when we get on camera to start speaking a little faster. We get a little bit nervous. We're making sure we, we get everything in there. I'm trying to watch the video while I'm trying to look at the teleprompter, so I'm looking back and forth here. You can get off track pretty quickly. And I could be talking about the touchdown pass, or touchdown run, into the next clip, which is of a punt return. And then that doesn't make sense. That gets confusing. So it's an art, and it takes some practice. The thing that we've told our talent time and time again is, guess what? You're not on camera. 
you don't have to be watching the teleprompter. Pick up your script so you can be looking at your script while you're looking. We have a monitor in the television studio. You can see the monitor over the script to make sure you're on pace, okay? And if you get off, if you get a little behind, you don't have to say everything that's right there. Just cut some of it. But it takes practice, okay? And yes, we will be doing that in sports pitch for sure, okay? Um, your crew, it could be one to three people when you go out and shoot during the game. It could be a one, you could, it could be a one man band. You take your own camera out there, you're filming the highlights, and we'll talk about how you get some of this here in just a minute. You're filming the highlights, and you're going to be expected to write the story. You may have to do a tripod if you decide you're going to do a sound on tape, a slot, if you're going to be on air, if you're going to be on camera. You may need a tripod if you're going to interview somebody. Because when you're shooting the highlights, you don't want a tripod. Why not? Why would you think, Morgan, you would not want a tripod if you're at a football game shooting highlights? You can't move as well. That's one more big piece of equipment that you've got to move from one end of the stadium or the other. Or if I stay on the highlight on the sideline with a tripod and two players are coming at me, it'd be a little harder to get all that out of the way, right? But then, Matthew, whenever I'm doing the interview after the game, why would I want the tripod? Stability. I want to make sure that it's not bouncing up and down. If the game action is a little bouncy, you kind of expect that. Everybody's moving. You really can't tell. But if I'm interviewing the coach and just breathing, I move in my arm a little bit, I can bounce that camera. Plus, at the end of the game, I'm going to be a little tired. I want to make sure that's steady. Okay. So one, uh, one man band, you may be doing it that way. You may have a photographer and a reporter. We're seeing a whole lot more of this right now because of cutbacks. So the more skills you have, if you want to be talent, Allison, Jada, learn to shoot and learn to shoot well. Because if you can shoot and you can be the talent, better chances of you getting a job, okay? Could have the two people where you have somebody doing the photography and you're there as a reporter and you're writing notes and you're telling your videographer, hey, I want this shot or give me some of this or I need some cover video, so get that. Or you may have a three person group, which is highly unlikely these days, but in that case, you're going to have a field producer. What do you think the field producer's job is? What is that person going to do for everything? Uh, kind of run the whole thing. What do you mean? Uh, Could. Have you seen some of that? What do you think, Chris? What's the field producer going to do for you? Hmm? Uh, I mean, my thought was kind of a, it's just a, uh, I guess I was thinking kind of a uh, director. Not a, necessarily an overseer, but it's, you know, wearing your first two, your one or two people you and everything. Breaking it down into a third field. So, you know, they're going to pick which, uh, which shots maybe, how uh, the kind of plan is beforehand, and then allow the other two to do the. You're on the right track. I'm mostly asleep. I, you're I, you're I, on I, the right I'm track. Asleep. A field producer is going to help you find the stories, they're going to help you spot. So you may be trying to write, your, your photographer is getting some video. They may be something, seeing something happening that's really critical. So like you may be having, your team that you're covering may be having a bad defensive day. They may, you're, you're focused on the game. Your field producer may be over here seeing what's going on in the huddle, seeing the defensive coordinator letting them have it and going over plays. And he may say, hey, photographer, give me some of this. That's some great cover footage right there, okay? May also, see somebody important at the game, you might want to get an interview. Because, yeah, I'm doing the highlights for the game, but something else might pop up. Peyton Manning might be at our game. That's a big story. Let's go talk to Peyton, okay? They may say, hey, we've got Peyton Manning over here. Let's go get in a quick interview with him at halftime. And so he'll go over and he'll talk to Peyton Manning and say, can we get a quick interview with you at halftime and talk a little bit about why you're here and what you're looking at and that sort of thing. And so then you've got another story. So I've got my highlights that are already assigned, but then another story has happened and I can go over here and get this one, okay? 
That's important to have. You need to know one another's jobs. Why is that important? We stress this through our entire program. Why is it important to know one another's jobs, Michael? job market, it's better to know more. Okay. Better to know more. As a job searcher, it's important to know every one of those jobs. Jay, to why else? I mean, if you have to go out and do it all by yourself, and then you don't know what you're, like a, a photographer or field person is supposed to do, mm -hmm. and then you come back to your job and you're like, well, this isn't what I wanted, and then... Yeah. And it's, you know, if I want my photographer to get me a certain shot that is not possible, I don't want to waste time trying to explain this is the shot I want and why and get into an argument there in the middle of the game and we miss half the action because I'm asking for something impossible that's not going to look good, that's not going to work right, okay? So it's helpful to know everybody's jobs, okay? What do you want to shoot? First thing you want to get is some cover video. This is the sort of thing we're talking about. When they're running out in the huddle, um, if it's a rainy day, for example, and I'm covering a football game, before the game, I might want to get the crowd and see all their umbrellas and all the, the uh, slickers and all that stuff because it's pouring down rain because I, I might want to be talking about the weather. Um, if they're playing for you know, Arkansas and Louisiana play, they play for the silver boot. I might want to get some cover video of the silver boot. All right. So think about what's going on in this game. If it's just a homecoming game or whatever, get some crowd shots that show how many people are in the stands. But think about, and that's going to require you to do some research. Is this a big game? Is there some significance to this game? Or is it just a regular game? And I just need to get some, some cover video. Get the key plays. Football's easy. Because what are you going to shoot? Touchdowns. Field goals. You may look and see if there's a big sack or a big pass and interception or things like that. Now that we shoot on SD cards, it's a lot easier because I can get the main stuff, and if, it, if it's something that's not going to work, I can delete it. And I can just get rid of it. When we shot on film, you have to have all of it, and you have to make time stand. One of the things that we talk about that will really help is get the scoreboard, so you know at specific times when a big play has happened. So in football, if somebody scores a touchdown, paint over and get the score. If you're doing basketball or volleyball, you never know when there's going to be a big play happening. It's so frustrating when I've been shooting, I've been shooting, I've been shooting. All right, all right, all right. Yeah, okay. Nothing big is happening. Oh, crap. And a big play happens. I shot at the uh, MIAA basketball tournament, did the highlight uh, shooting for that for Jason Katz, who then did the editing and the voiceover. And I shot six of the games, I think. It never failed. I would be shooting, shooting, shooting. All right, I need a break. Somebody steals the ball, gets a breakaway dunk. I didn't get one dunk because they dumped every time I put the camera down. How about the camera down more? Do what? <laughs> You're looking for some good action, some big plays. Okay. Volleyball, football, or volleyball, baseball, uh, basketball, sports like that, where it's just continuous action. You're just going to have to shoot a lot. But then, like every so many points, get the scoreboard so you have some frame of reference. Because then, you know, we're going to talk about this here in a minute. When you go back through the play-by-play, -play, or when you're writing your notes, you have an idea of where to look, so you don't have to just scrub through the whole video. Okay, so you have an idea where those things happen. Um, do get some celebration. Get the coaches talking to their players. They call the timeout. Get those types of things, because that breaks up just the game action. I may be talking about during the game, for example, that. Missouri Western went on a 15-point run until Dave Schleifer called a timeout. And I've got Dave Schleifer calling a timeout. I've got footage of them talking in the huddle. And then all of a sudden, the Jennies go on a 20-point run, reclaim the lead and get an advantage. Okay. But I want to be able to show what broke up that run and what started it. So you have to think about those types of things. And then get your interviews. You don't always have to have them, but it's better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. So after the game, you may want to do a stand-up with the head coach. You may want to get a key player and do a stand-up with them. You don't always have to do, well, if you're doing highlights, if you're doing a highlight package, you're not going to do a stand-up in there. If you're doing just a package itself that you're going to, you know, like Katie Smith, who's our video coordinator for athletics, she puts a highlight package on the UCM Athletics webpage. Sometimes she'll do a stand-up, sometimes she won't. Okay. 
But again, better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. If we're doing our highlights and reading from the desk, Jade is not going to shoot it and do a stand-up herself. She may get the coach, but she's not going to be on it. Then when you get to editing, um, again, get some shots of the scoreboard after a touchdown, after five to ten points in volleyball or basketball, um, just to show when those things have happened. Get your cover video. That should go first. I'll lay that down so you get some context of this game, and you're going to be reading over that. Then get into chronological order as the game is happening. You don't want to show the celebration at the very end of the game right up front. Again, this is broadcast. We want to build to our climax, so you're going to save for that. Get matching video. You don't have to sh talk about a specific play or every specific play. If the defense in a basketball game played great, then show some video of one of our players getting a steal or a, um, a great defensive effort where we force them to keep passing the ball around and they miss the bucket. Or we get a big defensive rebound and kick it out and we go transition and we score. You don't have to talk about what's happened on this particular plate. Just put several, make a montage and put several of those together while you're talking about the great defensive effort. Okay. And finally, in your writing, during the game, take notes if you can. These things help a lot because you can use the voice memo. So I've got my camera, if I'm a one-man band, I've got my camera, I can use this and do voice memos about specific thing. Get a shot of the clock, hey, it. 15 minutes to go, Jennings were leading 20 to 17, then they started on a 20 point run, something along those lines, all right? Remember, you're not writing a vertical pyramid. Remember, you're gonna do the who, what, when, where, and they get into chronological order. And then for some, it's easier to write it. For others, it's easier to do the editing and then write to the video, okay? Those of you who have done some of this, what's, what do you find easier? Whenever we were doing the highlights, like for basketball, I think I wrote it first, and then, wait, yeah, I did write, no? Are you talking about like when we were doing it off the iPad? Yeah. That's not exactly what we're talking oh, about okay. here. We did a little more loosey-goosey there. I was going to say, we can do you first here. Sort of. I mean, you, you were writing as the game was going along. Yeah. Last year during, well, when Jay was in my advanced sports broadcasting class, a lot of times she would take my iPad out and just get certain video clips, and she was tweeting those clips out. But then at the end of the game, she would take several of the clips, put them together, and do a highlight package. Um, you were you tended to write and then get the video to go with it, but you were limited on how much video you actually had because of how the capacity of the iPad. I like to write the story and then get the video to go with it. Because you're more than likely, number one, like in football, you're going to have every score. Basketball or volleyball, you should have most of it. I like to write it knowing what I've got as far as video goes and then go and get the video to plug in. Okay. Because we record every live, every game, I know I've got every play from that. So if I have somebody with a camera shooting highlights, they may not have... Um, a key bucket that started a run. But I know I've got it off the TriCaster for when we do the live run cast. Okay. I, I personally, I like to write better because I can always edit out some of the writing or add some to it if I need to. Okay? All right. So covering an event and creating the highlight package. Your assignment for this one, and this assignment is due June 26th. This is due the last Sunday, okay? I want to give you some time since this is one you're not as familiar with. One of the things you're going to have to do is create highlights. So I've given you 10 or 19 highlights. I've laid them out, and I'll show you where they are here in just a minute. I've laid out 19 highlights. You need to pick 10 from that list of 19, okay? You do not, unless you get a wild hair and you want to, or this is something you enjoy doing, you do not have to download that YouTube video and cut the highlights out. What I want you to do is just tell me, I'm gonna use this clip, and I'm gonna use this from this point to this point in that clip, all right? Um, so for example, like I wrote here, my highlight package would be number one, number four, number five, number eight. 
I'm going to use those. And I'm going to use this length from each one of those clips. Okay? I want you to write a toss to the highlights, where you're tossing to what's going to be said. And then I want you to write a script to read over the highlights, so your voiceover. So you will go ahead and write the package script for this one. Okay? Um, your toss should be more, uh, no more than 15 seconds, but no less than five. This you would read on air. You would be sitting on the desk tossing through the package, and when you got to the right point, which is going to be in your script, it's going to say take package, that's when your video highlights are going to come up, and then you're writing the script that's going to go along with that. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, make sure you're writing to the video, but you're not parroting the video. So, for example, if your video shows Stephen Curry uh, hitting a three-pointer, your script would not say, here, Stephen Curry hits a three-pointer. Rather, your script would say something like, Stephen Curry put the Warriors up 82-79 with this three. Okay. So let me give you an example. I've given you, well, this is what it would, this is what, This is how it's going to look. Welcome back to Sports Pay. Before the break, we saw what the Jennings were up to this past week. Now let's take a look at our mules. Jason, tell us about football. 25th ranked mules football. This is his toss. Is looking to improve their record to 3-2 and two this past Saturday at home against Missouri Southern for family weekend. They're all of a sudden we looking there's the highlights. One at home. And when he's saying now, he has scripted. a quick three and out. The ensuing punt is blocked by... Clayton Cooper and the offense would take over from there. Garrett Fugate goes back to pass and finds Alex Strong for a 52-yard bomb, which sets up this two-yard run by Jordan Keeney to give the Mules an early 7-0 lead. UCM's offense goes back to the air as Fugate finds Jay-Z. Jalen Zachary for the 57-yard touchdown pass, 14-0 Central. After a three-yard touchdown run by Rodney Smith, this Billy Greco 30-yard field goal gives the Mules a 24-point lead, still in the second quarter. And that's like I said, you're going to shoot. Lions you can shoot the scoreboard to give you a reference. You don't show the scoreboard. That's just something for your reference. You're going to cut it when you make the seven yard line. Two plays later, Fugate looking, scrambles to his right, finds Josh Pickro with the floater in between two Lions defenders. Mules with a 31-0 lead at the break. The Mules got the ball to start the second half as Markel Smith finishes off an eight-place, 75-yard drive with a score. The Mules' next drive, well, same old, same old as Fugate with the quarterback option, keeps it himself and leaps over Lions defender, 45-0 UCF. Mules backup quarterback Aaron Siebenshu says, anything Fugate can do, I can do better. It's now 52-0 UCF. The Lions were able to get on the board of the field goal, but the Mules' Anthony Saputo is credited with the safety. Mo is excited as the final score from Walton State in Kennedy Field. Mules 54, Lions 10. In just his fifth collegiate start, Garrett Fugate finishes the day with 448 yards of total offense. You want to put a bit traffic like this in there, you can. In Notice he's not talking he about all these stats. He's not talking about how many points he's three yards. You don't need to say what you're, you're reading on a script in a graph. Okay. You don't have to put the graph down if you don't want to. The entire offense finished the day with a school record 705 yards, 370 through the air, and 335 on the ground. Mules will look to continue their winning ways as they travel to Topeka, Kansas, to face the 3 and 2 Washburn Ichabods Saturday in the MIAA TV Game of the Week. Kickoff is set for 2.30 p.m. Welcome back to the sports page. Before the break, we saw. Okay. Now, this is the highlight package that I've given you for your assignment. I've laid this out there for you. I've taken all 19, I've put them in order, okay? And they're in chronological order, so you don't have to guess where they are. I've also given you a description of each of those highlights. I'm sorry, they're only 17. I've given you a description of each of the highlights, what's happening with each one of them. You also have a PDF of the box score from the, this game and the play-by-play, -play, okay? 
so you can kind of give some context to it, all right? This is nine minutes and 44 seconds. Now again, you don't use the entire clip. Some of these clips are like 42 seconds long. I want you to tell me I would use from this point to this point, okay? So like this would be cover video. I would maybe show four seconds of this. I don't need to show the whole thing and then stand there. But this is where it might be where I'm talking about they were looking to extend their five game winning streak or something like that. script that you saw for Jason's whenever he was doing the highlights for the uh, for football from sports page. 
that script is on there as well as an example. So you see this is Daniel coming out of the break. You see it's on camera two. It's a three shot with Jason, Kier, and Daniel. Then we cut to Jason. This is what he was reading on camera. And then take DDR. DDR is what plays our video. Football highlights, how long this highlight package is. And that's when he starts reading his script, voicing over the highlights. Okay? Does that all make sense? Okay. One of the things that I have noticed, let me be perfectly frank. We are not a broadcast journalism school. That's not what we do. We don't even have a journalism degree. We're a digital media production with a concentration in journalism. Okay. A lot of students like to, or not necessarily like, but they're okay with writing stories for print. When they get to doing it for broadcast, it gets a lot harder. Why do you think that is? It's a different writing style. Hmm? It's a different writing style. It's a different writing style, but, with, but what else? When you write for print, what do you have to do? To do a new story, to do a, to do a new story for print, what do you have to do? Say you're going to cover a football game. What do you have to do to write the story for print? You have to go to the game. You have to maybe interview the coach and a couple players after the game. And then you go back to your, your residence hall or your apartment and you can write up your story. If you do it the way you should, you write it because you're not, you, your deadline's not for another, it's not till later the next week. You get away from it, you come back a day later, you edit it, hand it in, done, right? Piece of cake. If you're doing a package for broadcast, you maybe have to go to the game. I mean, if you're just if you're doing a package of that game, you take the camera out there, you shoot the game, you have to interview the coach after the game, you get some video of that, and then maybe you go back to your residence hall and you maybe you write up your script of what you want to say, and then you have to come up here to the university to the studios or to the lab and you have to download your footage, and you have to edit it, and then you have to voice over and put that all together, and then you have to maybe get a rough cut to your professor, and then your professor says, okay, this is good, but you maybe need to tweak these things a little bit, so you go and you tweak these things a little bit, and then you're done. You have to make an extra effort. If it's not of a particular game, and you're gonna have to call and, and schedule an appointment, so say you wanna do an interview with Coach Boda before the game, you call them, you set up a time, you go over and you do it. Or you just do it over the phone. Or you take the lazy way out and you email them your questions. Right? Broadcasting, you actually have to go over to Coach Boda. You have to take the camera on his schedule. And maybe you want to talk to a couple of players. Well, they can't meet at the same time. So then you're going to have to go find them to get them on camera. Then you're going to have to get some B-roll to go with it. The point I'm trying to make is what we're finding is... Students may not like to write for print, but it's a heck of a lot easier than doing a broadcast package because it's all on your time. Aside from getting with the, the subject that you're interviewing, which can be done on the phone so you don't have to ever leave your car or your residence hall or wherever, you can do it on your own time. When you're doing it for broadcast, you have to be there. You have to go wherever they can be, when they can be there. You have to come up here to do your editing. So understand that doing broadcast is more difficult because you can't do it just when it fits into your schedule. And you may have to work three or four different schedules to get it done, okay? Whereas I could sit in my residence hall on my phone, now I actually have to go there with the camera, I have to check out the equipment. There's more to it, okay? Ain't no easy way around it. <laughs> it's just how it is. But keep that in mind, okay? It is fun. I do it. I go out and do these things for my students a lot of times. I enjoy it. But be aware that it's going to be a little bit more of a challenge, and you're going to have to keep that in mind, okay? Questions? All right. I'm going to get grading caught up this week. Um, 
Next week when we talk about broadcast right is again we're going to go down to the studio um, so you can see off the teleprompter. We're also going to be talking about sports talk radio. So we'll talk some about that. Uh, this Sunday your feature story assignment is due. Um, next Sunday is when your sports cast assignment is due and then the highlight package is due on the 26th that last Sunday. Okay. I will also say that discussion board and blog posts, uh, every week we've had fewer and fewer. I don't know if people are forgetting them, if they're just like, oh, forget it, I'm not messing with that one. Don't forget to do these assignments. I know it's a lot. You've got a 16 week class happening in six, okay? Don't think, well, can we just cut some of this out? No, because then everybody's gonna wanna take just a six week class. It's a 16 week class condensed into six. You're done in six weeks. This is week four. We have three to go. All right. Make sure you get your assignments done and get them in. Okay. Those of you who are going with us tomorrow to Arrowhead, we're meeting at the Circle Drive right out here at 7:30. We're leaving at 7:30. Bob Moore, no relation, was the PR director for the Chiefs for a number of years. He then became their historian. He has since retired. I will tell you right now, he's a crusty old fart. He's kind of bitter about the direction PR has gone in professional sports. He did it the way I did it. Yes, it's media relations, but you're also promoting your program. You're also promoting your organization. And he's been talking that PR anymore, it's all about media. It's like enough to the media, trying to get as much coverage as you can. And he said if I contacted them, somebody from PR, they probably would have called me back any time of day. And I believe him because I've tried to try to get with the Royals and I can't get a response. I've tried to try with the PR office with the Chiefs and I can't even get a response. Bob, I know. So he's actually semi-retired. He's coming back from, he lives on the East Coast now. But he happened to be coming back this week. And so he's here from yesterday through Thursday. Today through Thursday. And so he's going to meet with us and take us around. We'll tour the stadium. Um, you can take pictures. It is really cool. I've been there many times, so it's not as cool to me, but the last time I went, I thought I was with a bunch of first graders. They were so giddy. Um, one of them said, we're actually going in the locker room with a player's dress? Yes. We're really gonna get to go on the field? Yes. <laughs> yes, we will. Um, but then he'll also talk about media relations. He'll talk about how things work on a game day, how things have changed. So I have questions for him. He's a really good guy, fun to talk to, but He's kind of great. So, okay. You see Clark's mansion? Hmm? There's a mansion inside there. Really? Yeah. yeah I've seen it. You've never seen it. Yeah, one of the yes. girls oh. goes here and his niece. Oh, yeah. To the Canadian Game concert with her. Oh, well, people found out about it when they read the stadium and they heard him in there because they remodeled the Cool. Yeah, they have a whole way to it. I doubt we'll see that. <laughs> <laughs> we, he will take us through the Hall of Fame, which is really good. And he'll talk to, to you all about that. Okay? All right. Those of you going, see you tomorrow morning. Those of you not, I'll see you Monday. Got questions, give me a call, give me an email.